Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 14. You got myself, Ryan, you got Sam, and we got Jackson. Hey. And today, Sam's going to take us through a little bit of industry news, keep us up to tabs with everything going on um, in the film industry. Um, then we were actually joined, me and Sam had the pleasure of um, interviewing MJ and Anna Dixon from Myco Films which is really cool, you guys will enjoy it. We're also gonna be discussing villains within films. So I hope you guys enjoy. Sam, over to you. So there have been so many um, scheduling changes it, that it's hard to describe all of them. Like, I, I was gonna, I've got one that I wanna focus in, I wanna talk about Warner Brothers, but within the time that I did the research on Warner Brothers, Sony rechanged the whole entire schedule, Marvel changed the whole schedule, Disney changed the whole schedule, it's becoming difficult to keep you, a tabs on. You've got a song. hard job at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I did look at though was um, the cinemas are obviously hoping to reopen in July. Jury's out on that one. But the one film that the focus point on that is that the big blockbuster to save everything is Tenet, Christopher Nolan's new film. I'm looking forward to that. It's still on schedule. There is no putting it over to VOD sites. It's just staying on schedule. Scoob, the uh, Scooby-Doo film, that's been moved on to VOD. That'll be out of VOD next month. There's a Scooby-Doo film. <laughs> yep, it's an animation <laughs> film. It's completely okay. animated, but like most things nowadays, it kind of crosses over into the universe of other Hannah well, live Barbara. Action, Not live action, but you know the multi, you know the joint universe. So Scooby-Doo's joint universe is that it was created by Barbara Walters, who... Um, or Hannah Barbara, not Barbara Walters. <laughs> or maybe it is Barbara Walters. It's one of the Barbaras or Hannahs. <laughs> but essentially, yes, yeah, she created um, Dick Dastley, all those characters, oh, Captain so Caveman, so okay. they're all going to be in the same film oh, together. I'd love to see a crossover with Scooby Doo and like Captain Caveman. Well, there <laughs> you go. That, that will be it's out. Like our childhood. <laughs> but Tenet is staying on schedule. I, I wonder if it's going to work. If it is, it will save the box office. It will make so much money. And it's weird, because Nolan's had this back and forth. If you remember in 2012, of course, the... Um, Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, we the horrific attack happened with the shooting. And it majorly affected the box office opportunities for Dark Knight Rises. It still made a shit ton of money, but it was projected to make so much more. And then that happened. And now he's having almost, well, the complete reverse because of a hideous situation we're in right now, Tenet may make so much more money from it. I think one of the key defining factors about Christopher Nolan is that he absolutely loves that July slot. He does. He, it's yeah. it's <laughs> very rare that he doesn't do it. Um, the other interesting thing with Warner Brothers is their, their big daddy company, company leader, AT&T, have been considering whether cinema is the future for Warner Brothers. Which then the cinemas were like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Why has this been decided? And then Warner Brothers quickly went, oh, no, 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 not yet. But there's been talks and it looks like we are going to start seeing the steps where cinema might become, as I always thought it was going to become, a museum for certain types of films. Or like a theme park where it's just blockbuster junk, but it seems like the majority is going to go towards VOD. But we'll see. Would it's that interesting that like talk's happening. Not so some... you go and watch different films at certain just, stages? Just, so. I think what, what you mean by that is like it, it would be like the theatre where you'd go specifically for something rather yeah. than like it's, it's an everyday uh, thing. It's interesting you say about festivals. The South by Southwest Festival, which is a music and film festival, they made a deal with Amazon where they're going to screen all the films that were cancelled because it was happening um, earlier this month. They're all going to be screened on Amazon from May. It's free for people to watch. Nice. Only 5% of the official selection actually agreed to this. The rest of the films said no. You have to remember with a film festival, it's about trying to sell the film as much as getting the screening of the film. So how then does that work? Well, essentially, they're pulling it back and saving it for other festivals. Ah. Or if they were having theatrical releases or whatever their plan was. Because in some minds, by Amazon screening it, all that money that the film costs and all of the, the prestige of being part of that festival get kind of taken away. On a more localised level, on an independent film, our good friend Tony Newton from Vestra Pictures has teamed with Josh Schultz for a um, <clears throat> new film called Deep Web Mystery Box. And they're releasing it online right now for free. So you can go and check oh, that nice. out on YouTube. 
Um, <clears throat> that's on Mort House Films YouTube channel. And yeah, go check it out. Leave them a comment. What is that? Mort? Mort House Films. We'll put the link in the description below. The link will be right down below. Yeah, thanks for that, Sam. Great industry news. Um, so yeah, like I said earlier, me and Sam had the pleasure of um, having an interview with MJ and Anna Dixon from Myco Films. So we did this the other day. Hope you guys enjoy. I'm here with uh, MJ Dixon and Anna Dixon from Myco Pictures. How are you guys doing? Are you? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, good. It's very sunny. It's a lovely day. It's a lovely day to be yeah. locked inside. <laughs> <laughs> nice weather to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's just up every year, isn't it? So. You could admire it. <laughs> um, yeah. Guys, just wanted to start off really by um, basically asking how did you guys both get into film? Oh, no, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, well, I think for me personally, it's, all, it's just always been something I wanted to do. I, I like, when I was a kid, I used to draw, like, co like take the video covers out of. Um, out of VHSs, and I'd draw like covers for movies on the back of them, and then put them back in. I used to do that. <laughs> it, it was like a little thing that, I, and I always used to really be obsessed about making kind of these like fake movies that I'd kind of made up when I was really, really very young. Um, and then I think, I think once I saw Halloween when I was about eleven. Um, that made me decide that I definitely wanted to be a horror writer. Um, and eventually I just kind of, because I was interested in that kind of thing, um, I just kind of ended up helping other people on um, kind of filmmaking projects. And kind of, to me, I thought, you know, this is much, much the place where I feel much more comfortable. So uh, I made the choice to kind of pursue that when I was about 16, I think. Um, and then I've just done it ever since then. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, I, well, I, in a very unfeminist way, I kind of married into it, obviously. Okay. <laughs> I did a lot. Um, I did some like stage stuff where I acted, which is not me. It's not. It's not a good thing for me to do, for anyone. Um, when and I was always interested in that kind of thing, like sort of art and music and stuff. But, um, but then, uh, yeah, when I met Mike, um, I started helping out in a couple of music videos. Um, when, when we're like just mates and stuff um, and then went on to sort of sell Flasher House to distributors um, which was like my first sort of big thing that I did in film so I'd, I'd never made a film before I sold one and then made Legacy of Thorn um, so I did it backwards a little bit yeah it's really interesting though it's quite cool because you don't often hear of people kind of coming into the industry in that capacity Um how did you two yeah. meet? I don't know. Well, we, I guess we'd always kind of known each other. Like, uh, we both kind of had friends in social circles, I guess, and like yeah. similar social circles. So I think we, um, I think we kind of knew who each other were. Um, and in the town that we met, Preston, it's quite a small place. So I think eventually we just kind of ended up becoming friends, if you know what I mean. Um, because we were friends for quite a long time, I think, before we got together. That was a really good thing. Yeah. yeah. So you'd already I built that foundation. Yeah, yeah, we definitely we, we definitely had like a had to make sure that we were gonna actually stay together. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> because otherwise being friends we were, we pretty much hung out all, all the time. Um I think we, we had a dance at Dark Side. Yeah, we met some, one night we we, both, at we, goth club. we met at a goth club. <laughs> and we, we really spoke. And we ended up dancing randomly. I don't know why. And that was it, really. It's like dark friends. romance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, some, there's a romantic way of telling the whole story and they're not so, so we'll stick to the romantic way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go with that. <laughs> um, guys, what was your first film? Um, together, or... Well, um... So oh, yeah. my, my my first I made shorts for quite a long time, um, but my first feature um, officially was uh, Slash House. We did make a feature before that called Creepsville. Okay. Um, it just stuck in like post production hell because it had 
like it was like a no budget film, but it had like such a huge crew on it for a no budget film. Um, that I just kind of completely lost control and track of it along the way. Um, so it's kind of sat in pieces at the minute with bits of ADR that never got finished and soundtrack that never got added. And um, so uh, the first official one was Slash House, which was started in 2010. Um, and me and Adam kind of met during that time um, yeah. while that was in post-production. I was, I was in Slash House, um, dead in a bath. That was like oh. the first. <laughs> he asked me, um, and I should have I should have learned then, really. <laughs> the same. But the first film we did together, we did shorts and stuff, and uh, Anna, you, Anna produced a lot of music videos and stuff with me. Um, kind of in between starting Slash House and our next feature, our first official feature together was Legacy of Thorn, I think. Yeah. Which was twenty. We started it, started pre production in twenty twelve, but. Um, we started shooting it in 2013, I think. Yeah, around the time Slash Rails came out. Yeah. yeah. Tell yeah. us a bit more about the uh, Myco universe. Now, I, I know that you guys have done a lot of films together, but you've been able to expand it beyond film as well? Um, well, there's a couple of comic books uh, that are usually for um, in the crowdfunding campaigns as part of the perk, but um, I think I'm sure Michael will talk about that. He's got like plans plans to do stuff like that there's um there's soundtracks and things artwork like the, the, well, i mean there's a ton of stuff where, where are the merchandising <laughs> kings of the world <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's um well i mean it was always planned to be a kind of a bunch of things um <clears throat> i always liked that todd mcfarlane talked about his four pillars which were comic books um action figures uh movies and cartoons um and i took a lot of inspiration from that um, when, from when he created Spawn in the 90s, I think. Um, because he was just kind of went off and made up his own thing outside of like an established system. Um, so I always took huge inspiration from the way that he, him and the guys at Image Comics kind of did that. So the plan was always to make movies, comic books. Um, we've, we're in kind of like prototype stages of action figures, which we were hoping would be out last year, but it's just... A nightmare trying to pull something like that together. That's um, so cool. <laughs> and then obviously we're hoping to do some form of animation and stuff moving in the future. Um, but it's all what we try to do is keep it all kind of part of the same story. Whilst a lot of the time you'll find that these things are kind of very separate entities. Um, we try to kind of keep it as one linear story to a degree. So like the like the connected universe sort of thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, but it was like that from design. I think I think it was around 2005. I kind of I wrote Slash House with the idea that it would spin off into a kind of bigger idea. I think that's really cool. To be honest, like you don't often see people expanding on let's say they take a, a concept an idea a film and then expand around it i know like big industries would kind of do that but on a smaller scale you never really notice that so uh, yeah that's awesome that sounds really cool well, i love the ideas yeah. of action figures <laughs> well i think um the, the the thing for me was the reason i wanted to do it was because i was looking at big studios and going why aren't they doing this why aren't we getting like um you know like essentially House of Freddy Krueger every year where we, yeah. you know, where him and Jason and Pinhead and what are going at it. Or, you know, at the time, I think Leatherface was owned by the same studio as Jason and Freddy. And I, I'm thinking, why are we not getting movies like this every year? Why are we not getting comic book movies that are crossing over? It, was, it used to drive me insane. And so the initial thought was, well, I'll, I'll do something like that because no one's doing it. And yeah. it seems insane. And of course, in that so since, doing it a bit now. in that time, it's now become kind of the in thing. I think in a lot of respects, in loads of other genres, it's become almost norm. If you think about Marvel, for example, they have yeah, the expanded absolutely. universe and things like that. But with horror, I don't know if you would agree, but within horror, it's only ever really been touched upon. And you had yeah, certain I mean, crossovers, but not a mass amount. But it's more of a 1940s thing. Yeah. done it retrospectively. I know Charles Band um, 
in recent years has tried to tie his past works together in a kind of shared universe. Um, but I don't, I never felt like it was intended that way. Yeah. I feel like it, you know, but that's a cool thing that he's done now because he can, because he has a huge back catalogue of, um, of, of, of titles that he can do that now. But yeah, I think in general, horror has never really been doing that. Um, and I think that's it's just it was just a, like a niche that I saw that I felt I could fill creatively. By creating the micro universe, you've been able to like actually have quite intense fandom. You know, like people actually sending you like designs they've done for like their characters they love and stuff like that. What's it like to actually have that sort of you know almost like mainstream fans? You know. Um, I, I guess I, it's weird. I guess we. We never really considered our... It's quite strange. I, I guess we we try to get to know people. I, it kind of happens naturally, I suppose. But you kind of get to know the people who are really interested in the work that you're producing. Yeah, we end up friends with, with, <laughs> yeah. with all of them. Um, so it's sort of like having like a, a little online social circle. They've, they've, uh, they've created a Facebook group um, called the Micropaths, uh-huh. which... Um, uh, we're in and they do watch parties and stuff and uh, but we more just sort of um, chat and we do get emails say it's suggesting methods of killing people in yeah. films which <laughs> 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 else gets that. Um, but but like from you know really lovely down to earth people just they really want someone to get axed in the back of the head and yeah like uh, which is it's weird um but yeah, well, they're sort of it's sort of like an expanded friendship friendship group because it, obviously we're not we're not major, so we have, we don't have loads of fans, but the ones that we do have are really loyal and kind to us and yeah and, and stay with us with everything we do and and understand that it's whilst it's low budget, you know our hearts are in the right place. And I think the great thing about that is that you know exactly who you're making your films for. It's a yeah. really strange thing, but like you you like I mean. Like, I literally, like, sometimes I sit there and think, would Pete, as who is a guy who I know who likes our movies, would Pete like this? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, because he's a fan of our films. And he, so you, quite often you'll, you'll, you're literally aiming it directly at your audience, um, which is, uh, it gives you a kind of tremendous amount of freedom, I, I suppose. Um, whilst I know, like, a lot of, um, low and big budget filmmakers will um, they they kind of have to kind of hit a broad spectrum if that makes any sense yeah yeah, yeah. Um, you know as to try and kind of hope that they please as many fans as possible but we we're kind of in touch with our fans all the time yeah. I, I mean like I say we don't really consider them fans more like you know friends. like friends who are interested in the same thing that we are yeah um, but touching on that like, do you reckon you can continue that moving forward? It, like, as your fan base, we'll call it fan base for now, but as that grows and maybe your popularity grows, do you reckon you can still keep that collaborative effort with the the friends, the fans going? We'll ever grow. <laughs> Beyond, <laughs> like, it's not been growing exponentially. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, I mean, that's true. But um, I think even when you get um, even even some f- or former horror directors who go on to make other stuff still have that um, that good connection with their fan base. Even even sort of mid to high level filmmakers can can still achieve that on some level. Um, I think it's really important to what to what we do, um, and it's really obvious that that's that that's where our our fan base is because when our films get wide distribution releases, um, the people, the general folk of IMDb and Amazon world don't don't like our films as much as um, as our as our core as our core. Yeah, fans. yeah, we we I mean, fan base aside, we're still victims to the the usual indie, um, you know, massacre that happens whenever you get a, a big release, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> where people don't want an independent film. And they don't understand how you could how you could be allowed to make films and blah blah blah. Yeah. You know. People are crazy. So, uh, but if, if I mean if if and it's a big if we ever got um, sort of, you know, more money or bigger 
you know, bigger budgets and um, and stuff. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think we could try and maintain that collaborative spirit as much as possible, and we'd still try and get people as involved as possible in our films. Because otherwise, how do you know? Um, you're making you know something what, good. What, like, yeah, uh, yeah. How do you know that what you're what you're making is landing? Yeah. Um, that's a good approach. I think, that, I think that's the reason that we've made stuff the way we've made it for so long. It's because um, <clears throat> you, we know who we're making it for. And like um, the second you start bringing in more, you start commanding more money, things change a little bit. They start telling you there's a little bit of a push to, well, no, don't cast the person you want. Cast this person mm. and... Do, do things this way, aim for it more to be like this, you know, and that's not something that we particularly like being told to do. So um, whenever that, whenever those kind of opportunities have arisen, we've kind of said, well, you know, is it what's more important, you know, doing something that's not the kind of thing we want to do or doing something that's directly for the people, you know, for our fan base and our fan base always wins out. That's good, man. That is good. Let's talk a bit more about your uh, latest film, Pandemonium, which uh, came out, was it March 13th? March okay. 2nd? 3rd. March 2nd, I think. March 2nd, yeah. Yeah, it's out now. It's out. Yeah, tell yeah. us a bit about that. Um, what, what the, like the synopsis? Well, just what it was like shooting the film, because this was a film that you what? did a uh, Kickstarter for last year, wasn't it? When you raised the funds. Yeah, around about now we were doing a Kickstarter for it this time last year. Um, I mean, for for me personally, I was I was eight and a half months pregnant when we made Pandemonium. Jesus, so <laughs> fair I play. Working, I was working during the day because I couldn't take any time off work because I was about to go on maternity leave. So um, I was working during the day and shooting nights. Um, uh, my legs swelled up <laughs> to some ridiculous degree. Um, I mean, we were lucky with um, with the, lo- the location that we had. We were shooting in like a serviced office, so there was you know sofas and you know you know what an indie film set is normally like, and it's very inhospitable. But there was ample sort of facilities and water and seats and stuff, um, vending machines. So that was good, uh, but I was pretty tired. Um, but um, because of that... Uh, I can imagine. A lot of people sort of stepped up to do the stuff I, I do. Because um, we don't our sets don't really run with everyone having an individual job. Um, we just sort of do what needs doing. And, but, and the, the stuff I do sort of usually encompasses like AD stuff. I'm sometimes on sound, like wh- whatever sort of... Needs, needs doing to keep Mike sane, really. Um, <laughs> I like that. So, yeah, well, it's my job on many levels. Yeah. <laughs> Not <laughs> only in a I'm... film sense. <laughs> um, so this this time, uh, Tiana, who played um, Molly in Bansa Dollhouse and in Slasher House 2, um, she, she sort of stepped up to, to AD and was sort of running through the shot list and stuff. Um, which she'd never done before, and she was amazing, and she's so she's so like adorable that everybody did what she said. Um, so that was really good, and it was it was nice for me to sort of be at a trainer and um, and then have a rest <laughs> and sit down. And a well deserved delegate. rest. Yeah, and but it was good. It was a really really positive experience. There was not a bad egg on on set. Everybody was lovely. Um, like. Everybody got on so well. We had most of the most of the, the sort of lads, the, the sort of naughty solicitor lads, staying here, and the panda. Um, the panda. In our, in our, <laughs> so, and they, they were very kind to me because I was very tired. It's good. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a really yeah, nice it was collaborative. Good. We had a, yeah. The, the boys from level six basically stayed in our house, so it was like you'd come off set, and then like you'd have these characters in your house. Like and we did that for like two weeks, and we had like a like a proper boys club. It was like it, it was amazing. <laughs> it, was it was amazing, um, and it was just so much fun. Like it, you know, it was amazing half of the time. But it was, uh, yeah, I love that. that also, um, but we we made a real conscious effort because we knew it was going to be quite hard, and because Anna was so pregnant, you know, that 
to cast as well, like people we'd kind of worked with on some level before, um, who we knew we'd like. I suppose you um, could trust the them. People, yeah, the only people we didn't we didn't know before shooting were the two leads. Yeah, um, but we did know of them. Um, Will Jones was in Ice Cream on the Beach. Oh, um, okay, yeah, yeah. Was, was by those guys, so. Um, yeah, and so, Oriana came from uh, Days of the Apocalypse. Yeah. Um, so we, we we kind of we we knew of them. Um, so we kind of had had it on good authority that they'd be good people to work with. Um, so I, so that made our lives like a hundred times easier, just knowing that like basically like some old friends would be coming to stay with us and yeah. help us make a film. You know what I mean? And it was it just that helped everything go really smoothly. Yeah. Nice. Now, my next question is probably a bit of a strange one, really, considering your circumstance, newborn baby and stuff. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of film, what do you reckon is next for you guys? Well, actually, we'll go on, I'll let you want to go. Uh, well, we did a crowd from the last year for Slosher House 3. Oh, nice. Um, we've made we made Slosher House and then four spin-off films, and then Slosher House 2, and then four spin-off films, and now... Uh, so, Sasha Ross 3 will be our 10th film, um, uh, which was successful and we raised, um, I think, more more than we'd ever raised in the crowdfunding campaign before. It was quite exciting. There was 25 slashes in it. Oh, <laughs> it's crazy. a big um, And we were supposed to be shooting it in a month. Yeah. Um, but uh, now all of the locations that we were talking to have closed down for, for the time being and they can't really talk about when we can shoot there and... Everything, as as you know, because I think we're all in the same boat, everything oh, is on yeah. pause. Um, Do you know, just to touch on that, right? Do you know what? Hats off to you guys for um, deciding to come up with another film project um, with a newborn as well. Like, that's dedication. So, well, you know, a round of applause. What? Circumstances dictate, but <laughs> well done. I, I was on maternity leave. I felt like I had all the time in the world. <laughs> right. That's a great way of looking at it. <laughs> well, I mean, and he loves it. He comes to set with us. Yeah, so we he's did, a good set, baby. After he's he was good. born, we did two pick up, two or three pick-up days on Pandemonium. And he came down and he keeps the cast entertained between oh. shots. And, yeah. you know, um, he, doesn't, he doesn't, he's not a crier. I think we're quite lucky with the baby we've got, to be honest. Because he came to Horror on Sea for the for the weekend. He wouldn't let me watch anything. But that's not because he was crying, it's because he shouts. Oh. <laughs> um, and if people are clapping, he thinks it's for him. He's very so. good-natured. So he, 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 he does make it a lot easier. Um, so yeah, he just he, like, genuinely he just gets involved yeah. in some form, whether he wants to or not. For now. I was going to say, you uh, should put him in one of your films, but that probably might oh, not yeah. be a great idea. <laughs> I don't know how you'd incorporate well, that. The, time, the time's coming, I think, where he'll, he'll show up. Um, nice. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's just, you just make it work. Like, we kind of have a motto, which is kind of like, just make films no matter what. Um, has always been our, our thing, and even having a kid, kind of, that's a, that's a no matter what situation, isn't it? Yeah, we made a couple of shorts and stuff with him. Um, nice. Not with him in, but with him there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, because I, was, because I wasn't going to, when, when, when we were doing Pandemonium, I was also finishing my law degree. Um, my uh, exams were about two weeks after Pandemonium finished, and then Ash was due the week after that. Um, wow. So it was just, and I was working, so it was, like, it felt like once Pandemonium was done and we'd had the baby, we actually had all of the time, because I wasn't working, I didn't yeah. have a law degree to do, like... Um, there was just the two of us at home with the baby and we had a ton of time to plan um it wasn't as easy as that because it's really not as easy as that (laughs) don't worry i've got kids i've got kids myself so (laughs) i know that feeling yeah but it does it did after after we went through all that yeah it, uh, it didn't feel like the um it didn't feel like we had no time at all um it does it does a bit more now i think maybe but um, it's also a really simple thing that you don't think about is when Anna was pregnant, it was really difficult because her and the baby were one one element. Um, but once you have a baby, you can put that baby down in a separate place while someone does something else. Yeah. It's just like, you end up with an extra person again, if you know what I mean. And I think that was like a, 
that that was a big challenge for us that uh, Anna couldn't really do anything physically um but once the baby was born that really freed us up yeah too. once the baby was born he was like come on off we go we like we rented we did a short film and we just uh, we rented like an airbnb to shoot it in um and we just we put him down on the bed and people came and said hello to him and kept him entertained while we while we shot and then he fell asleep for a few hours i mean we could see it from where we were shooting you know um <coughs> like we don't just leave him with strangers i know i yeah yeah <laughs> i wouldn't have thought um, that don't worry <coughs> guys um, yeah, made, it, made it so much easier yeah and now we've got quite as everyone has got a lot of time to sit and think about um what we want to do next and the fact that we maybe can't do slash house three as quickly as we wanted to um but we've still got the horror on sea deadline that we always work towards and we always want to have something we always want to have our premieres at horror on sea for one thing because it's the best festival in the world um but we we also want to um get in get in for their deadline um but yeah, so now we've got to think about something we can make that isn't slash our story because that yeah. will take a sort of a bit of a crossroads really, where we've got kind of we've got about three or four projects kind of like sat there in different stages of being ready to go. Um, so we we just don't really know which one it's going to be that yeah. gets off first and, really. And there was a potential that um, that a couple of them were going to be funded, um, but there's, that's all on hold now as well. So. Uh. Um, because a couple of them are a bit more um, high budget in concept, you know, like a bit more... Um, like very effects heavy, um, kind of animatronics and things like that, oh, which wow. you just can't... You can't, you can't, you can't do it well. You on, can't do on that on like a few grand, you know, you need a bit more but, um, money behind you. But that's all sort of, um, yeah, on hold for the time being. If you guys get um, bored, like, over the next number of days... We're doing our own little kind of horror anthology called You're Gonna Be a Star. Oh, cool. If you want to get involved in that, you're more than welcome. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll certainly have a look, yeah. What, what, what does it involve? What do we have to do? So basically, um, I can get Sam to send you the um, video and the synopsis of kind of everything that you need to do. Basically, we've done a pre-recorded question setting sort of thing um, and you've got to showcase your talent just film yourself showcasing that you can be as quirky and as fun as you want to be um, you can be as dark as you want to be but it's entirely up to yeah. you it's just to kind of help bring out creative juices while we're in this pandemic and in lockdown I'm not very good in front of the camera <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like. um, we'll, we'll see if Ash wants to I was going to say you could probably bring uh, Ash into it <laughs> like the magic baby <laughs> Guys, oh, I was going to ask, time. my final question really, is just what would be a dream project for you guys to do? Um, well, I guess in terms of kind of proper dream projects that we've been working towards, that's some of the stuff we're talking about really. So we've got a couple of projects that we've been trying to get off the ground for about a decade. Um, and they, until all this happened, they looked like, that might be a, like a likely scenario this year. Um, so that's a bit of a bummer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we have to wait for all this to kind of blow over to find out what that is. Yeah. Uh, what happened there. Um, but I mean, in terms of dream project, I mean, uh, Slasher House 1 was like my dream project. It was like an idea that well, I thought I'd never get. given like a franchise. Yeah. Yeah. Where, um, where would you go? Make your... I really, I'd like to do like one of the horror icons, like, but anything, like, you know, like, um, like, I'd really like to be challenged, like, someone through, throws, like, I'm just trying to think of something, like, prom night at me, or, you know, like, or mirror, mirror, you know, like, an, one of the obs more obscure franchises. Yeah. It doesn't touched, or like, or I'd love to do, like, like a leprechaun movie, or, um, like, <laughs> Is know, that a dig? <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing um, with you. Um, or just you know, like something, something like a little bit off. But of course, like I'd also like I'd love to do like a Halloween movie or a or a, a Texas Chainsaw movie or anything like that. Like I just 
like it's all I think about all the time is just different ways to tell those kind of stories. So, um, so anything like that, really. Uh, or I'd really love to do like uh, like a gothic horror version of Ghost uh, Ghost Rider. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and it's he's like the one Marvel character that like outside of like the big ones that everyone knows about. Yeah, I know loads and loads and loads about him. I've read like. I think every issue of like eighties and nineties um, Ghost Rider, and I'm just that's yeah, that's what I'd go for. What about you? Uh, airplane three. Airplane three. Airplane three. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we can both together. We can mix them both together. Like we'll do like a, a gothic Ghost Rider spoof movie. Yeah. Set in an set in an air, airplane. Yeah. Ghost plane. Rider. My my sort of film on it. Yeah. Like I like a pun. I like, I like pun after pun. <laughs> you do. Punderful. Uh, <laughs> Pundemonium. <laughs> Very punny. <laughs> uh, we, do have, um, we do have another film out um, in a couple of months as well, but we don't know where because... I yeah, mean, because everything's it's supposed closed. It's to be out in HMV and Asda and that, but... Um, <laughs> we just don't know what's going to happen. But yeah. um, the haunting of Molly Bannister... Originally, Bouncer Dollhouse um, is out on June twentieth, I think, at the minute. Although we, be- uh, we believe, but that sounds like it sounds like a Saturday. That's a Saturday, so we, so we don't think that's the right date. Um, it's <coughs> random. So it'll probably be the month after that. But it's available for pre-order. Yeah, so Amazon you can now. you can buy it at HMV online, and Amazon, and Zoom, or what, you know all those mad shops. What Zoom? Base, Zoom? Zoom's like Skype. Based yeah. on <laughs> Zoom's like a, a, a DVD shop as well. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Not FOP. No, there's Fox as well, but Zoom and Base.com and what's the other one? DVD Hut or something. You know all the mad stuff that they released. All those ones. Well, if you want, (laughs) if you've got links and stuff to, um, well, to the, I suppose, buy-in page, I don't know, to any of the distributors, um, send us them and then we can definitely put them on the link. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you. And we might have, be having a US release of Mask of Thorn as well. Yeah. Awesome. With, uh, nice. Yeah. But we just don't when know, we don't know when yet. <laughs> no, well, uh, guys, no, really appreciate. Oh, sorry, I really appreciate you guys talking to us. Um, That's all right. It's been yeah, fun. Nice, nice to for the humans, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. During these times. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? Well, what did you say? <laughs> and it gets us out of the house. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're in the extremely vulnerable category, both of us. Oh. So we're not allowed out at all. Yeah. <laughs> and we haven't been out for three Terrifying. Years. We've gone insane. <laughs> oh, I can understand it. I shaved my hair earlier. I had long wow. hair a year ago, and then I, I've since gradually cut it down, but now it's, um, yeah, I'm pretty much a two grade all over. Alright, yeah. I think, yeah, I think I'm going to shave Anna's hair later. <laughs> <laughs> and die. Mike, Mike Holiday shaved all his hair, wasn't he? He did. The ice cream, ice cream director. One of the two. Was a, that, was a, that was a film. He doesn't, like, tell ice, ice cream what to do. <laughs> right, guys, really appreciate it. Um, but, yeah, just going to say thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, really appreciate you guys coming on and talking to us during these difficult no, times. No thank you for thank you for having us. us. No worries. Have a good one, guys. And well, you. you too. Bye. bye. Thanks. Bye. So, guys, now we're going to be talking about um, the most iconic villains within films. So, the way that we kind of conducted this is we took out any kind of um, literature or comic book villains and we actually wanted to make it more about villains who were created for films and um, yeah we, we went with that and um, so we have a few different ones that we want to discuss but yeah so the first one I want to kick off with is Darth Vader massive Star Wars fan <laughs> <laughs> biggest villain in in history in my opinion I think I'm surprised neither of you jumped in as quick as. <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't disagree with you in, in that respect really because I think there's something about the the 
the mask itself that he's wearing that that really is quite powerful and and it, it means that I mean there's very very little uh, it, it, you can't gain any sort of emotional response from Darth except for the shoulders moving really because of the sort of stiffness of the of the costume so it's really just like acting by like leaning back and forth but the the effect of the costume the way it's shot um, particularly in the Empire Strikes Back it's like it, it, it just looks, it, it just has that sinisterness that really, yeah, freaks you out. The thing that interests me the most about that is that um, whenever it comes to Darth Vader, I think within the original trilogy, Darth Vader, Vader only had, what, 36 minutes worth of screen time? Like, really? properly, yeah. Um, and yet he's considered the most iconic villain mm. in... Well, well, one of the... One one of, of the... Okay, yeah. All right, Sam. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like so for that regard, and it does go down to The Empire Strikes Back, and credit to the director of The Empire Strikes Back, because the way that he shot it and the way he did it, he, he composed a load of light um, so that it bounced off Vader. Um, and yeah, some of the shots, and just even the way that the fight scene is choreographed at the end... Like he's so commanding and so controlled. And that was probably one of the first controversies in terms of film where it's like, oh my God, I am your father. I don't think it was one of the first. It's one of the big mainstream ones. It was ones. one of the big yeah. ones. Like, yeah. if you think in previous times, that's one of the big ones that stands in out. In pop culture. Yeah. 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 But it does stand out. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the as well... And that's the, what defined him. Whereas, sorry, what, what then, Re uh, Return of the Jedi... Like they tried to mimic some of the shots and stuff, but then Palpatine, the Emperor, so this kind of took over. For your talk next yeah, week. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Was, <laughs> I mean, one of one of the common traits that you you actually pointed out there. I love was Vader. The screen time. One of the key things you tend to find in in some of the most iconic villains in any of films is that you don't really see him on the screen that much. You will hear about him. Everybody's talking about him, and like especially, um, it works in every genre, but it works very. Well, in horror, mm. you think about like Hellraiser is a good example. Yeah, Freddy. Any of those films, they talk about them constantly, and they maybe get maybe 20, 30 minutes of screen time compared to like the main narrative of either a victim in that respect or just your protagonist. And they do this a lot in pretty much most genres when it comes to those sort of villains, especially anything of a more, um, I guess, thrilling aspect like noir. Most of the more iconic villains in noir and I don't want to talk about the film because I hate the director, but Usual Suspects, Kaiser Soze, the whole concept of Kaiser Soze, this ultimate villain, that during that investigation, he's just building this hype of who this person could be. You never see who Kaiser Soze is. Suspense, isn't it? Yeah. It's, you can create so much suspense without even revealing who your villain is. And I think that plays so well in a lot of, um, yeah, more entertainment-driven kind of villains. Like the blockbusters and stuff like that, you know, when you, when you don't see the villain as much, it does work a lot stronger. Even the villain in um, 2001 Space Odyssey, how? The robot. Mm. It's a terrifying villain because it's just a robot that has no emotion whatsoever. And it's in the film. I mean, like, technically it's there the whole, a lot of the time, but it's only heard in the film towards the end. And it's chilling. It stays into your mind. I think that's one of the, the key things with all villains is that they could say something or do an action that's going to stay with you, even if they're a real small element of the film. David Lynch works perfectly with villains in that regards. His villains are so iconic that they stay with you, even if you can't remember like key elements of what the fuck happened in the film. He does it um, brilliantly with his gangster characters as well, or his dark kind of probably gangsters, but it's never clear because it's Lynch. He does it so well in um, Lost Highway. You know, the guy, the pale face guy. He's, the, he's a villain in that film. And he's terrifying. And he's in the film for maybe about 10 minutes. But his whole iconicness just stays with you. And personally, with Lynch, he does this best with um, Blue Velvet, with the character Frank Booth, played by Dennis Hopper. That's like, to me, my iconic villain of all villains. As soon as he walks into that scene, and again, it's an attribute that all villains share, your eyes are on him. What is he going to do? 
and it's always going to be something that you didn't expect him to do because the character just commands and demands the room's attention. You know, it's that with good villains. I think. Uh, I think that, that though that the idea that all villains have that is kind of I don't know. I think there's a much more wider um, look at villains um, yeah. than that, and I think uh, one of the one of the villains that always stands out to me. Despite the fact that he is on the screen for all of a few minutes, um, is uh, the villain in Snowpiercer, because the the whole build up to that villain is them going through the the train carriages and and, and having their revolution <coughs> against the system and fighting these people that have been sent sent down to to stop them, um, the military men and things like that, and the way that they behave paints this this depiction of the guy at the front of the train as being this menacing dictatorial force but when they reach him he's this polite man who sits there and discusses philosophy of the idea but it's the same him. idea and yeah it's exactly it's it's all about the build-up and but they don't necessarily have to be then this commanding presence it's all about how how that's been developed throughout the throughout the film in the first place um that's all I really had to say on Snowpiercer. <laughs> like, I just, no, but just... You're, you're right in that way. and It, it is one of those things where a, a villain doesn't have to follow that same path. It's about creating those iconic characters, sure. And in Snowpiercer, you could argue the bigger villain in the film because she's on the screen more is Tilda Swinton's character. She's more iconically like nasty throughout. And you would... She's... Yeah, she pretty much has most screen time... But when she's not the villains. one that they are like aiming screen. to defeat. Yeah, she's, no, I know what you mean. So she's that's of, that side uh, of She's more of a henchman mm. um, of, of the overarching villain. Um, but then also in, with, with Snowpiercer, and again, this is what I love, uh, love about that, the villainy in that film, is that really it's, it's the train itself that is the, is the villain. Yeah. Because the, the, the way that they have to keep the train maintained... Um, is is through you know child child labor essentially isn't it and uh, so by the end the the protagonist actually stops the train and that's that's the end of that kind of thing um, but that's that's why I think the villain to me villainy is is really about the the narrative the plot um, and what 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 is happening and and who's responsible for that and how they're not responsible for it and partly responsible for it. That's the kind of nuances that I like to see mm. in villainy. I would agree with that. And as much as like um, you think about gangster films, right? Um, how many times are you put into the situation of a character and you follow that character and you, you know, you kind of, you're following them and you're liking them. And you're like, oh, okay, I hope this guy gets out of it. But by the end of it, you realise they're the villain. Like Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. He is a villain. The way that he conducts himself, the way that he um, portrays himself, he just, he becomes super crazy. Like, just at the sight of someone looking at him wrong. That's that in itself. But you still kind of go with it because he's one of the main characters, main, well, I don't know. Well, he's a side villain. He's one of the cronies. And that, that's another yeah, point, though. Yeah, you do get those... Because um, with side villains as well, their own actions can be more villainous than the main villain. Yeah. Um, and but in, in films like that, though, like with gangster films, the likes of a side villain, Joe Pesci, is a lot more gun-ho. I'll, I'll just yeah. take people out. Whereas a villain would probably be a lot more calm and calculated in what they're doing. Because Almost they're higher up, yeah. yeah. Like, because they're sense. higher up, which again you can say is similar to well, Snowpiercer. Mm. Yeah, well, crime films as well. Like when it comes to villains, you're right. Sometimes at the beginning, the character thinks they're the good guy. So there's two good examples of this. And although you can call it a, a, completely a crime film, it is a crime film. It's a different kind of crime. But there will be blood and Scarface. It's about agree, yeah, two Scarface. rising. It's the rise of two people. All right, one of them's for oil and greed, but the other one's cocaine and greed. They're still on the same journey. They still think they're the heroes who are just trying to build a good life. And, you know, but then, of course, the bigger villain in both of those films is capitalism. Without getting too, you know, political, it is, that is what it is, you know? See, I would agree with you on Scarface. The only disagreement that I would have is that um, I honestly think Tony Montana initially is a anti-villain. Um, and the reason I say that is because he comes to Miami 
it's Miami, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, he he wants a better life. He wants to do better for himself from Cuba. And he has the opportunity to, but he gets himself into crime. And then he wants to overthrow the crime lord. So he's against the villain, but then he ultimately becomes the villain. So initially, I think he's an anti-villain. But I think I think when you when you look at the time and and the uh, when you look at some of the, the sort of uh, secondary sources around that of, of what was actually happening at the time, uh, a lot of the people leaving Cuba, particularly the ones getting involved in organised crime, were from uh, Batista's military, which and they committed war crimes, they'd uh, murdered and great villages it was you know these were not good people necessarily that were fleeing i mean it says it in the opening title. tony montana yes. tony montana didn't do shit it says <laughs> it in the opening title credits i know it does refugee camp. <clears throat> but again it's perception isn't it it's oh no, you, definitely because at the end of the day someone can put, put film content out there and it can be whatever right um christopher waltz for example, within Hans Lander, yeah, 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 in in Glorious Bastards, that he is a true villain, mm. right? You put that out there, you're meant to hate him, but actually, you mm. love him because of the way that he portrays it. It's those and iconic again, characters. It's yeah, it's perception, isn't it? it? And like, I loved Tony Montana. I loved Al Pacino as Tony Montana. You're always rooting for him. And even though you know he's the villain, you're rooting for him. See, I didn't root for him at all. Oh, I, was, I, I was aware that this is all going to collapse because you know it's it built that collapse. way. You never and played never the really PlayStation game, him. though. I did play that. <laughs> he survives that. I remember yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a brilliant game. It's an interesting one, though, because um, the other guy that, like... Because Oliver Stone wrote um, Scarface. Brian De Palma directed it. But Oliver Stone also directed uh, Wall Street. And Wall Street, again, it's a product of its time in regards to the politics of who the real villain is. Gordon Gekko? Yeah. He is like the ultimate capitalist, the ultimate Wall Street guy, and takes Charlie Sheen along for the ride, who sees him for the evil that he is, and that kind of thing. But again, it's playing into... There's a certain element of... Although that's not propaganda, propaganda is always played into what villains are. Basically, the character of Gordon Gekko is capitalism. It is a complete representation of that. And when you go into that propaganda sort of tool and play the other side, you can... It's not a good thing. Hollywood's very bad for doing it. It does it all the time. But when certain politics go around the world, oh, look, all of a sudden, your villain is looking a little bit more closer to what's happening in the real world. And um, I haven't seen the film, but I know that in Rocky, Ivan Drago is very much a product of that because of the whole communism thing in the Ivan 80s. Ivan Drago. Is that nice? I say? <laughs> Ivan, no. The... It is Drago. Drago. Drago! You've never seen the I've Rocky seen Mountain Rocky scene. He, he climbs first, basically a one. mountain and then goes, Drago! <laughs> I've seen memes of Drago beating the, the shit out of um, the, the other guy. This is how much Drago. I know the Rocky one. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny you say that though, because like in terms of that, the way that they portray it, so that was brought out in 1985 and um, it was Rocky IV. <clears throat> and basically Apollo Creed dies via Drago and the, the, the way that the film set it up is very much like Russia is this massive superpower oh we can knock on all these Americans we can mm. take over but it was made by Americans which is very interesting it's a propaganda <clears throat> tool exactly because we know who the heroes going to be yeah like touching on your point but then as it goes on um Rocky agrees to fight Drago and then like he's just given a shack in the middle of nowhere um, surrounded by snow so he's got to improvise in his training techniques and classic Rocky they always do a montage but the montage consists of Drago having every single like proper um, training facility that he could possibly have to his ability there. Um, Whereas Rocky is very much using the elements. So they made Russia seem like the rich kid. Yeah, the, yes, that's yeah, they did. really bizarre. They did. They <laughs> that's did. really yeah. bizarre. But that's the way that America was probably trying to portray it, uh, portray it at the time. Um, <clears throat> so again, 1985. Um, Rocky used wood. He used the snow as his training ground. 
I like and that's so like Randian, isn't it? That, that rugged individualism. And, and even with the training montage, they kept cutting between what Rocky was doing and what Drago was doing, and it was really interesting. And then come the fight, um, Rocky gets like he starts beating him up, and then weirdly enough, you guys probably don't know this, but weirdly enough, the Russian crowd. It started cheering for Rocky, started cheering <laughs> for America, basically. And you yeah. have, it's it Khrushchev? Khrushchev, I think, was the, the leader then. He's sitting in the stands looking at the trainer of um, Drago, like, what the fuck is going on? And it was just, like, it's a great film, don't get me wrong. It's my favourite Rocky, but it is so stereotypical of, like, the underdog and... Like, that's like the you thing. Said. Yeah, the thing. That's an interesting point with underdogs, and it's one thing people forget with villains. They focus more on like action and stuff. But think of what a comedy villain is. That it's always about the underdog, and then someone who's better in some sort of way, but not really better. But it doesn't matter. Because, but has more resources, or yeah. has more, you know, more money to throw at something. Yeah. It's... And again, it's it's sports films as well. Mm. And when you tie them all together, you get like because. There was a certain time when Ben Stiller didn't stop making those sort of films. I mean, <laughs> look at, um, what's it called? Dodgeball. I love Dodgeball. But Dodgeball has every single one of those attributes of literally, you know, the underdog and then the richer one. And it plays off a lot of, from what I know, 80s films. A lot of 80s films are built around that, those sort of sports films that are either family driven or romance or comedy. They're even going to be one of those ways. And it's going to be the same storyline. The big villain is going to be richer. Or they're slightly better. More resourced. Yeah. Mm. They've got the resources, but don't worry. It's about the underdog story. If well, you can you dodge a wrench, you can time. dodge a ball. Well, I think this, that's kind of interesting as well, because part of the you know the role of a villain in, in some films um, uh, is to justify the hero's actions. So if the villain is bad enough, then you can say, well, the, the actions of the hero to stop that villain are, are justified, you know, even if he's blown up a hundred buildings or something. But... Um, in terms of that, that sort of justifies their process of trying to get to the point that they're good enough to beat that person. So even if they're neglecting other aspects of their life or the other things like that, so it's it's the same thing as well, like of, of the villain I... needing to justify the hero. No, no, I can't. I can't. You can see that a lot in westerns. Mm. Maybe not so much nowadays because most westerns are more revisionists who kind of revise that idea of should it, can I have justified that because of my actions. But in the earlier westerns, that's pretty much how it to work because they had to shoot each other at the end, because that's like you know attributes. And um, randomly, it reminds me with with Darth Vader as well, like the color, the black hat, because mm. that's a whole western it's attribute, it's isn't a it? Yeah, but it comes from the black hat, white cat, a uh, white hat. This is your good guy. This is your bad guy, kind of thing. They do that in loads of things. Mm. Yeah, they do that in Westworld, for example. Well, it's a it's a western. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, but, I think. Um, that's why I think, to a certain extent, uh, you know, you can uh, you can boil a villain down to the sum of their their actions, mm. and uh, that's why I I think that one of the one of the greatest villain characters ever, uh, not necessarily uh, performances or, or other aspects, is um, the, uh, the 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 kid in John Wick who shot the dog. Oh, it, yeah, it justifies yeah. so much. It justifies the whole film. Just through that one one action, and then his cowardice at the end, and Theon, that really it Theon, exposes Theon how <laughs> it exposes how weak he is throughout the throughout the whole uh, the the whole film. Even even when he's in that position of power, really, he's just this weak little boy. Who's <laughs> Do you not think that comes <laughs> from being introduced into power? That's why he thinks he's untouchable mm. because he comes from a luck a luck. A little, He's come from a luxurious life that he can do whatever he wants. And he's got all these henchmen around him to protect him. and yeah, Exactly. And so that kind of starts him to do what he does and he doesn't really think about it. And then when he finds out it's John Wick, it's like, oh shit. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's, but there's, whatever. That, there's that element of the, 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 rich, the rich guy and the you know, guy that's coming again, from nothing. You know, yeah. you that's again that. with Rocky. Mm, exactly. It does exactly the same exactly. thing. So if we were to look at um, summarising those key aspects of what is a villain, we've looked at quite a few because we've discussed the idea of being talked about but never seen because that's definitely an attribute we see. 
there's the idea of having more resources so you can allow your hero to be the underdog. Mm -hmm. As you said, there was the fact of um, being able to justify that their actions are definitely going to be more evil than your hero. The characters need to be memorable. And that's why we see the same attributes being shared through good cinema villains. It's not like, you know, it's like they say, those things work for a reason. And they do. Mm. Absolutely. So guys, really hope you enjoyed Trash Arts Take Episode 14. Um, as ever, please give us a like. And a subscribe. And check out the Midweek Interview every Wednesday this week with Kieran Edwards. Exactamundo. Anyway, guys, please take care, be safe. Enjoy lockdown as much as you can. And uh, trash arts take out. Ta-da. Bye.